Who's that? Hi. Should we get one of these? So should we get started? If I hit play, does it go? There we go. So my name is Adam Oseri. I lead Newsfeed at Facebook. And news is as important as it's ever been. There's an immense amount changing in the world, and it's changing quickly. And I want to also acknowledge that, and all of you know this much better than I do, it's a difficult time to be in the news industry, which is why we at Facebook have been spending a lot of time recently trying to figure out how we might be better partners. And we haven't always been the best at communicating, which is really a problem from my perspective on Newsfeed, because you as journalists and publishers cannot make informed decisions about if and how to leverage our platform unless you understand how ranking works. So today, I'm going to talk a bit about how Newsfeed works in some detail, and also talk a little bit about what we're focusing on this year at Facebook to try and give you guys a sense of what's going to come so that maybe you won't be surprised. Taking a step back, how people consume information has changed dramatically in the last few decades. Take TV, for example. In the 70s, which really wasn't that long ago, TVs looked like this. And most households had access to eight, maybe nine, TV channels. Today, most of us probably have access to eight different versions of sports channels and hundreds of other options. And this has all changed very quickly and been somewhat disruptive for television. And it's not only TV that's changed dramatically. It's also true for film, for books, for music, and importantly, and why we're all here today in this remarkable room for news. So how many of you read news publications that are written outside of the cities in which you live? You can raise your hands. So most all of you. That wasn't even possible only a few decades ago. But today, I live in San Francisco, California. I read the Financial Times and The Economist, which are written in London, over 5,000 miles away from my home. I read the Wall Street Journal, which is based in New York City. I read Stratechery, which is written by a guy named Ben Thompson, who's just a thoughtful analyst out of Taipei. And this wasn't even possible in the old model because, as you guys know, the old model was news was printed with ink on paper. Newspapers were put in trucks. Trucks were driven around cities and delivered by hand to people's homes. But a lot's changed. And how do we get here? Well, for one, we all ended up with a baby computer in our pocket. And these phones, for the most part, ended up with access to the internet, which meant that though the cost of producing news is still significant, the cost of distributing the information has actually dramatically decreased, which has meant that the barrier for entry for becoming a publication has also decreased. So there are a lot more publications out there. And even more importantly, from a consumer standpoint, the access to information has increased exponentially. So we live in a world now where we're inundated with news and other forms of information on a daily basis. And a lot of people walk around like this, with their heads in their phones. I know I get up in the morning, I roll over, I check the weather, because I live in San Francisco and the weather is really screwy. I check the local basketball score. I'm a Warriors fan. And I check dozens, maybe even hundreds of texts and emails. And it can be really, really overwhelming, as I'm sure a lot of you can appreciate. And so we've just ended up in a world where there is an immense amount of information all the time. And we at Facebook have found success in helping people sort through all of that information and find the gems, find the few stories each day that people are going to find meaningful, the types of stories that are going to go home and talk to their friends or their family about. And we believe you as journalists find success in creating those gems. And not only identifying the few stories each day that everybody needs to know about because they're important, but also by figuring out how to tell those stories in compelling ways so you can cut through the noise and reach your audience. And you can only do that on Facebook if you understand how the platform works. So today I'm going to talk about 
what's an algorithm in the first place, other than a difficult word to spell, how newsfeed works more specifically, and themes for us for this year. So what's an algorithm? Simply put, it is a formula or set of steps for solving a problem. That's a little abstract, so let's go through a more everyday example. My wife's name is Monica. Let's say I'm waiting for Monica at a restaurant for lunch, and she's running late. Maybe she texts me and asks me to order her something. At that moment, I have a problem to solve. I have to figure out what to order Monica for lunch. And so we can break that decision-making process down into steps. The first is see what's on the menu. I can, order, I can only order things that are available. So what's on the, you know, let's see what my options are. The second is consider all of the information I can to try to make a more informed decision. Is it lunch or is it dinner time right now? Does Monica like fish? Uh, what's this restaurant known for? What's its specialty? From there, I need to make some predictions. Is she going to like the fish? Would she think it's weird that I ordered her a chocolate fondue instead of an entree at lunchtime? Then I have to make a decision about what to order. And in ranking, we have names for these steps. They're called inventory, what's on the menu, signals, which what we consider, predictions, and then scores or decisions. So how does this work in Newsfeed? We actually go through the exact same process. The menu are the stories that are shared by your friends and the publications that you follow. Your Newsfeed is completely comprised of things shared from your connections. From there, we're going to look at each story, and we're going to try and assess how interesting each one is to you as an individual. And we're going to consider things like who posted this story, when it was posted, is it a photo, is it a video? But we're actually going to consist, or consider rather, hundreds of thousands of signals. Little things, like what time of day is it right now? Are you, uh, what kind of phone are you on? How fast is your internet connection? Then we're going to use all of those signals to make some predictions. Things like how likely you are to comment on a story. Also, how likely you are to spend time reading that story, or how long do we think you might spend reading the story? Would you watch the video through to completion? And some qualitative predictions, like if we were going to ask you, or if we did ask you, how likely you would, would you be to say that you found this story informative? And then we consolidate all of those signals into a relevancy score, a number that represents how interested we think you are in that story. And it's only our best guess. So then let's go through this in a bit more detail. So the most important input into what you see is the friends that you decide to make and the publications you decide to follow. Because that's the only stories, those are the only stories that are eligible to show up in the first place. So let's look at my experience. This is my wife, Monica, in the middle, and a couple of my friends. When you first signed up for Facebook, assuming that some of you are on Facebook, you had an empty news feed. And then slowly, over time, you connected with the friends that you care about and the publications that you were interested in, and you built up your own personal experience. So now you open up Facebook one morning. What Newsfeed is going to do, or what we're going to do, is we're going to look at all of the stories that you could see, because you have not seen them yet, and they've been posted by friends and publications that you're connected to. And we're going to assess or make an educated guess about how interested you are in each individual story. So let's zoom in on a story. This is my brother, Emil. He's a musician. He lives in New York. He's pretty rad. He posted a photo of himself uh, playing guitar. He usually plays bass, but now his guitar. So we're going to look at a number of different signals, things like who posted it, in this case, my brother. And I tend to like and comment on his stories in general. We're going to look at the fact that it's a photo, and we're going to know that I tend to like and comment on photos. We're going to look, on how many, we're going to look at how many likes and comments it has, and hundreds of thousands of other things. And then we're going to take all of this information and make some predictions, calculate some probabilities. How likely am I to like this story? How likely am I to comment on this story? How likely am I to share this story? How likely am I to spend time reading this story or say that I found this story meaningful? And then we're going to consolidate those predictions into a number, which is our best guess at how interested I am in this story. And maybe you're friends with Emil too, 
and you have different interests than I do because we all have different interests. So the same story in your feed would, might have a very different score. And we do this for every story from all of your connections every time you open up Facebook. We go through the entire process over and over again and come up with our best guesses for how interested you are in each one. And then we order the stories by those scores over a billion times a day. And this is fundamentally how newsfeed works today. But I thought it would also be worth spending a little bit of time talking about what we're focusing on on Facebook this year to give you guys a bit of a sense for what's coming. So three themes. But before I jump into it, I do want to acknowledge this actually makes me a little bit uncomfortable. We don't generally share much about what we're doing before we do it, because we don't have all the answers. And sometimes we have ideas that don't work out, and we never end up shipping them. So I ask you to bear with me just a little bit, because I'm going to show you some things that might not ever actually see the light of day. Three themes, though. One, discovery. We want to do more to help people find interesting, awesome things that they're going to find meaningful in their lives. Two, integrity work, specifically on newsfeed, or especially on newsfeed. We want to ensure we're doing our part to live up to our responsibility to support informed and safe communities. And then lastly, partnership. We're trying to figure out how to be better partners, not only to the news industry, but to the media industries at large. Diving into discovery, taking a look back a little bit, I think you can even consider Newsfeed a discovery product. When we first launched Facebook, there was no Newsfeed. You had to browse around the page manually and find what had changed, what was new. And Newsfeed helped you to discover what you might find interesting by helping you do that. Small products, though, like pages you might like, also, I think, are discovery products. They help you find sources of information that you're going to find meaningful. And so you can follow pages, which is important. It's a critical part of the experience. But one idea, and this might not work, is what if you could also follow a topic? Maybe the most compelling and interesting content about your favorite football club doesn't only come from your football club's page, but also from your friends' pages or your friends' profiles, fans' pages, uh, sports companies and sports publishers. Maybe we can connect you to that in some interesting way. So we're experimenting with different ways to do this right now. And another is the idea of a discovery surface. Newsfeed is a place where you interact with and engage with content and stories from your connections. So what if we could create another space where you could interact with and engage with content from sources of information that you're not even connected to yet? We don't know if this will be a tab, a feed, a bookmark, or work at all, but we have a few tests running right now, and we're excited about the prospects. Next, integrity. We are a very large platform, and that comes with very serious responsibilities, one of which is to make sure we're doing our part to support informed communities. There's been a lot of attention on false news, which is an important issue, but there are other issues as well. And so we're trying to make sure that we spend enough time and care thinking about and approaching these problems to make sure that we're doing what we can to make sure our, our community is informed. So one is improved reporting. We're experimenting with a number of different ways to do this right now, but we rely heavily on our community to help us identify problematic content. And so making it easier to report just helps us get more signals, back to how ranking works, so that we can do a more effective job curbing problematic content. And reports are signals. They get factored into ranking directly. Next, clickbait and false news detection. Any form of problematic content, be it clickbait, false news, hate speech, etc., when it ends up on the platform, as some invariably will, we need to do as best a job we can at identifying it and then reducing its spread through the platform. And so whether this is through classifiers and algorithms or through partnerships with third-party fact-checking organizations or news publishers or even reporting flows for our community, we're invested a lot in figuring out how to better identify problematic content. Disputed flags. False news is a really important issue. But we, as a platform of our scale, fundamentally, one, can't read all the content that comes through our platform, and two, cannot become arbiters of truth ourselves. I think that would be irresponsible. 
So we rely on our community, but we're also now working to roll out a third-party fact-checking program, currently in three countries in Europe, also in the US, looking to internationalize as quickly as we can, to let third-party fact-checking organizations dispute stories that are false. To, and then we surface that dispute in product so people can have that context and make smarter decisions about what to read, what to trust, and what to share. And lastly, education. Starting today, we're rolling out an educational promotion at the very top of Newsfeed in 14 countries in over 11 languages for hundreds of millions of users to try and help them better spot false news. Because one of the best things we can do to combat that problem is to help create a more discerning reader. So these are some of the things that we're doing, but there's going to be more on, uh, in 2017. Lastly, partnership. We know we need to become a better partner to the news industry and to other industries. So one area of work is product work. Work on story formats, helping publishers tell more compelling stories, specifically on mobile, through new formats. The second is local news. We know that local news is a cornerstone of local communities, and it's struggling. And we do not have the answer. So we're working with people or publishers in multiple countries right now through workshops to try to identify opportunities for us to participate and to help. And then lastly, monetization products. It is essential for any news organization to have a sustainable business model. Otherwise, they can't survive, not to mention thrive. And so whether it's through mid-roll video ads, which we're experimenting with, improvements to instant articles, monetization products, or other ideas, we're looking for ways to help journalists make money from doing the good work that they do. All of this work, though, is part of the Facebook Journalism Project, which we announced in January. And one key difference between how we developed products in the past and how we're trying to develop products this year is we're trying to do so in partnership with publications from the beginning of the projects. And that's new for us. We actually, honestly, don't know how to do that well, but we're figuring it out. The other pillars of the Facebook Journalism Project are better tools for publishers around data and insights, and better tools for people, specifically around news literacy and other educational initiatives, which is related to the News Integrity Initiative, which is a consortium that got announced earlier this week that we're a founding member of and proud to be part of, that is a collaboration between educators, ad agencies, tech companies, and soon-to-be publishers, focused on news literacy. Because we know issues like false news are bigger than Facebook. They're industry-wide, they're societal-wide problems. So they're going to require industry-wide solutions, and there'll be no silver bullets. So we're looking forward to funding and participating in projects and research around these ideas. And with that, I'll just say that in addition to continuing to try to improve the experience of Newsfeed both for people and for publishers, we're also deeply invested in figuring out how to become better partners. And with that, I'll thank you for your time. How you doing? What's it? Sure. Um, it's a little it's low. It's a little low, yeah. As, as, as I think you said, it's, it's, it's out of a 70s airline lounge, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm Jeff Jarvis from City University of New York, and full disclosure is that we are part of the uh, News Integrity Initiative. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, so I, I'm going to ask some questions myself, and I'll come out into the room to ask questions. We also have Twitter. There are a few questions. I want to start with one of those. Uh, Fabio Cusi asks uh, how the... Um, uh, fake news flagging is going. What do we know about the behavior so far of uh, whether that has an Im a fake news flag has an impact on people not sharing or, God help us, sharing more? So a few different things. But first, I want to put the disputed flags in context of all of the different work. Because the third party program is important, but it's actually only one piece of a larger system. So fundamentally, there are three steps. The first is for us to do better to reduce the incentives to put false news on Facebook in the first place. And we found that on Facebook, 
most false news is actually financially motivated. We've seen um, spammers, and they're mostly spammers, switch what political party or political candidate they're supporting. And if you look at the links that they click to, you'll see often there's 70, 80, 90, even 100% ads. So one of the most important things that we can do is make it more difficult to make money by, from posting false news on Facebook. So that's incentives. Then we know some will end up on the platform. False news has existed long before Facebook, long before the internet. So we need to do a better job when it ends up on the platform, identifying it through some of the products I talked about before. And then understanding that some will actually and unfortunately make it into people's experiences, we need to give people more context about what they're reading so that they can make more informed decisions about what to trust. The disputed flags is part of that. Um, other ideas we're exploring but don't have anything specific to announce yet is can we surface more information about stories or publishers? If a publication has only been around for a few days, maybe that's useful to know. And then educational efforts through either the News Integrity Initiative or our own educational efforts on product. Um, and so that's kind of how the whole system, at least how we think about all of our, the different opportunities we have to do better. And we've seen overall that false news has uh, decreased on Facebook, but it's hard for us to measure because we can't read everything that gets posted. There's over a billion things posted a day. So these are, are on our best estimations. That said, I don't want to get too, I don't want to jump to any conclusions about that because that might be due to some of, the, of our efforts, but that also might be to do with the fact that we're post-election cycle in the US right now. Um, and so we can't properly tease those things apart. So even though it's reduced, I don't want to assume we've done enough. I think we've got a lot more to do. So I'll stipulate something that many in the room may disagree with, but I'll probably agree with Facebook on. I don't think Facebook is a publisher. I think it's something new and different. And I also personally see danger in putting you in the position of becoming the editor or censor of the world, which I think a new German law that's been in the news in the last week threatens to do. Yeah. So I want to go through just a minute of, of kind of the tactics of, of, of that. Because uh, you said when you spoke that when you find something that looks hairy, you try to reduce the distribution of it. Yes. But you don't kill it. Yes. Right? Um, and there are efforts to try to say that, uh, treat you as if you're a publisher that should be edited and, and things should be killed, but you also believe in speech and giving people the opportunity to say things. Uh, where, where is there a line there at all um, around where you would kill things? Uh, uh, I presume that you would err on the side of not killing it, but instead not promoting it. Is that true? So the core tension is between our belief in people's rights to express themselves and our also understanding of our responsibility to reduce the distribution of any type of problematic content false news, um, but things like hate speech too, which the German legislation actually is, talks about. I think that the line, there is a line for certain types of content, and those lines are clearly defined in our community standards, which have been public for years, which are focused on things like violence and bullying and hate speech. And there's content that we take down every day. But in general, we'd like to err on the side of allowing people to express themselves while also taking our responsibility seriously. So for things like false news, we focus more on reducing its distribution as much as we can while it's still being responsible given our scale. But I want to be really clear that we don't want false news on our platform. It's bad for people, it's at odds with our mission, and it's bad for our business. Eroding trust in Facebook over the long run is going to be really bad for us as an advertising business. But we're also trying to be responsible given our scale. And that's something we're trying to figure out how to navigate as effectively as we can. So let's talk about responsibility. Um, we as journalists in the room, and you as a platform, are finding ourselves coming together now. And we have, a, we have a perhaps haughty sense of our civic responsibility, our public responsibility. In Mark Zuckerberg's 6,000 word tome recently. It was a little long. Um, uh, I'm sure editors here could have made him shorter, yeah. Um, he um, talked about uh, responsibility and, and the public. So, Start here. When you engineer the formulas of Facebook to create a pleasant experience, Facebook has long said that friends and family are the most important, entertainment is high, and, and information is there too. 
But how do you, in your own mind, balance that mix of a good experience on Facebook and the responsibility, now that you are a primary distributor of news, uh, of, of how informed people come out of their experience? So a few different things. One is we try to look for opportunities to do both. So backing up a little bit, we have values and we have standards. The standards are our community standards. And the values are newsfeed values. And those are reflected in the decisions we make on a daily basis, which affect what people see. And we need to be very proactively transparent about how those work. On the newsfeed values, the first is, as you said, to connect people with their friends and family. When we ask people about why they use Facebook, that's the number one reason they give us. It's honestly the value proposition on which our company was built. But the second is to inform people around the, about the world around them. Because we believe in informed communities, but also because we know people find meaning in learning. And that we believe is not only good for people, it's, but it's also going to be good for the platform as a place where that can happen. Now, those things can be at odds, but they don't have to be. You can find an, an article that was posted by a friend both connecting, because maybe they added some commentary about it, and informative. So to start, we try and look for ways of nurturing what's good across all of our values. Uh, in addition, then we also just try to use, I think, what is probably one of our most important resources, which is our time, by focusing on both in a ma really meaningful way. By investing in products for journalists, by being out there, speaking more, communicating more, trying to figure out how to be more effective at explaining things. Uh, and by also investing in monetization products for journalists as well, which we think is going to be important over the long run. And we think that we can do that and also connect people with their friends. And that's actually part of the value of Facebook. It, it's, I like to say this, and it doesn't sound good to most people, but Facebook is, I think, in su successful in large part because it's a one-stop shop for a lot of people. It's just convenient. You can go in, you can see what's going on with your friends, you can hear about what's going on in the world, and all of that in one place is something that people enjoy. So I want to embrace that, but then figure out also how to do that responsibly. So Facebook has become more open recently. Uh, the black box is opening up. You're here talking. You've had, Facebook has had roundtables with publishers. I've had the privilege of going to one of them where there were high-level publishers and, and you were there. And one of the things that I found very, and, and I, uh, at CUNY, I held a uh, session with product development people and Andrew Anker, who's in charge of product for news. Mm -hmm. In all of these discussions, I'm fascinated, now that we're coming together, that we speak somewhat different languages. Yes. Or we have, use the same words with different definitions. Yeah. So let me try a few words and see what the Facebook view is versus uh, our view. Um, the first, uh, obviously, is news. When, when Mark Zuckerberg named Newsfeed Newsfeed, we, I think probably as a, as a community, mocked that. It's not news. News is what we make. Yet, you know, your brother played a good gig is news to you. So how does Facebook, how do you the proprietor of Newsfeed define news? So we're not looking to redefine news. I think news is new information about noteworthy events is essentially like the most dictionary-like definition that I've come across. Uh, and that's, I think, fine. And, but what we're trying to do a little bit more at Facebook is focus on informative content. And news is a critical piece of that, but it's not the only critical piece. Learning about the basketball score learning about how to sue the colicky baby, learning about the fact that my niece just graduated from college. These are all informative stories, um, and we want to be able to nurture that content as well as traditional news. So the next one, uh, in conversations with Facebook folks lately, I've heard this word that I also mocked called informedness, yes. the state of being informed. Uh, but it actually, it's, it's growing on me, I have to admit, because it is what we're trying to do in journalism is we try to inform the public conversation, or James Carey, the legendary journalism professor, would say, we begin by being informed by that conversation, which is occurring on Facebook. So there's a need for both of us, journalist and public, to be informed. Um, how do you define being informed? How do you define informedness? And I'm really interested in how you measure that. Sure. So we do a number of things today. But basically, being informed is learning things that are meaningful and important. Today, we actually, in ranking even first class, we do have some strong informed signals. 
So one thing we predict is how likely you are to maybe like or comment on a story. I'm making her smile by making her uncomfortable. Um, but we also predict other things. So we actually can, we try and predict for each story, for every person, how informed they would say it is. And we do this by asking tens of thousands of people a day in over 30 different languages all over the world how informed they find specific stories, and then we look for patterns. So we actually predict that. And that is something that we value in ranking. It's one of the things that we predict, so it affects the score, the relevant score. But I also want to be forthcoming about the fact that that is how informed people feel, not exactly how informed people are, and that's an important distinction. How to measure and optimize for how informed people are is something we don't have a good answer for yet, but something that we're actively exploring, and also an area where I think collaboration could be really useful. Because there's a long history of publications doing things to measure how informed people are through things like quizzes and questionnaires, et cetera. Um, and what to ask and how to ask it, I think, are critical to getting this right. And so we're actually actively talking with a few different publications about what they do to see if there's anything that we can learn and then incorporate uh, into Newsfeed and to Facebook more broadly. Now, some people have accused Facebook over the years of fostering an echo chamber because you only are with the friends of friends, you're in a filter bubble, and so on. Uh, and the argument is made lately uh, as one effort to address the uninformed and uncivil public conversation we are too much having outside of Facebook, that Facebook should expose us to different ideas. And as I thought about saluting that flag, I, I came around and said to myself that Facebook is not about so much, it's not a platform for ideas as it is a platform for people and whatever those people want to do with each other, yeah. right? So I don't think it's Facebook's job necessarily to expose the uh, communist to capitalism and the capitalist to cap communism, but I do see value as a platform for people in Facebook finding ways in the discovery platform of exposing me to strangers so they're not strange anymore. Yes. In this age of building up borders, in this age of finding fear in the person we don't know who doesn't look like us, yeah. it really strikes me that the opportunity Facebook has and the internet has is to expose us all around. I see, I don't know whether he's in the, in the room, but, but Dave Weiner, one of the great pioneers of everything web, uh, RSS and blogging and podcasting and so on. I, I remember back to the early blogger cons, when we bloggers got together. And it was invigorating to meet people from around the world you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Hossein Darakshan is here, Hoder. And I met him in Iran because he blogged and I blogged. There's a magic I want to recapture without the incivility that is nowadays coming along with lower borders. How do you see Facebook being able to, when you talk about communities, are those the communities you already have or the ability to form and join and build new communities? So filter bubbles, I think, are fundamentally a result of human psychology. We self-sort and, and select like-minded friends, like-minded publications, uh, and the like. And that phenomenon exists online, offline, and on Facebook. At Facebook, we've historically tried to always look at are people exposed to as much content that they disagree with on Facebook as they are off Facebook? So the bar isn't 50-50, that's unrealistic and also somewhat unnatural. And we found regularly that that's the case. That said, you're asking, I think, about what we can do, if anything. And I think we need to be really careful here because I don't think it's our role to decide what stories on a given day everybody should read. That would overstep our bounds. But I also think we do have some opportunities. We can give people access to other sources of information. We can give access um, to common ground. And what I worry about when it comes to echo chambers is really polarization, is the idea that groups of people are gonna become further and further separated, not on Facebook specifically, but all over the world, and that we'll lose this notion of common ground. And so, what can you do? You're suggesting maybe in the discovery area, exposing people to other points of view. I think that's absolutely an area that we can and are exploring. That said, we need to be really careful. Showing someone who's very right something that's very left 
is probably going to polarize them more according to the, to the research as opposed to the other way around. So some of the more straightforward ideas actually might backfire. So we want to be, one, very careful about us not overstepping our bounds given our scale. And two, make sure that whatever we do is actually effective at helping people connect, because that's in line with our mission. Uh, and we're exploring it. We don't have anything specific to announce. Um, but I think it's an important issue, and it's something I personally care deeply about. Before I come out in the room for, for questions and discussion, um, let me switch gears a little bit to more practical ends of the business. Uh, we followed on stage, we're honored, I think, both of us to follow on stage the Washington Post, which yes. is doing spectacular work these days, not only in its journalism and reporting, which is job number one, but also in its innovation. And, and I was saying to him last night that I think that the Washington Post is becoming the go-to big paper to go to for um, trying things and being willing to try things. Uh, the, the Times is as well. Papers across Europe are as well. Uh, Mario Calabresi will be on this stage at 3 o'clock, and he's, he's doing great work around there. So there's a lot of papers that are doing this. We are constantly whining to Facebook and Google saying what we wish you would do. What do you wish we would do? What would a great partner be uh, in terms of trying to explore and develop uh, what we can do to improve journalism and bring journalism to the conversation where and when it occurs on Facebook? How do we break out of our presumptions of the last century about making articles? Instant articles is great, but we can do more than just make articles. So think for a moment about if you had an ideal, terribly innovative journalistic partner, what kind of fun do you want to have with them? What do you want to do with them? I think both as a partner but also focused on actually better informing people and better supporting informed communities, the, the the ideal would be someone or an organization or a publication that was just very, very focused on figuring out how to make meaningful interesting, how to take the most important things every day and then figure out how to tell those stories in compelling ways. But not just on Facebook, but also off Facebook. Because, like I said before, there's just an immense amount of information out there. And if the important stories don't cut through, then we're all going to suffer for it. And to, make, to help them cut through, we can do things as a platform to help support that type of content, valuing deeper signals of relevance, looking at things like how long people read, not only do they click, that sort of thing. But as a news publisher, you can experiment on platforms like ours, but also others, with tools like Instant Articles, but also others, to figure out how, from a content creation perspective, to make important stories as interesting as possible. And maybe Instant Articles helps, maybe it doesn't. Personally, if you have better success as a publisher using web links to tell stories, monetize, and pursue whatever other interests you have, I'm fine with that. Because the real end is just a more informed community. I've argued to some publishers that they should consider starting a new product entirely on Facebook. Do you think it's possible now for a publisher to start a product on Facebook make money there to support it? I think it's possible, and I think some do, but I think we have a ways to go to make that more appealing to more people. And I think the biggest issue there is really monetization. Yeah. Fundamentally, you can't run a news organization unless it's solvent uh, or you're subsidized. Um, and there's different ways to do that, right? You can be a subscription business, you can be an advertising business, you can be something else. Uh, and we have products that we already have built to help support some of those different businesses, but we, they aren't as universally effective as I'd like. And so, yes, that can happen and does happen, but for it to happen more, we need to do a better job. Let me come out into the room. Questions? I'm going to go and start with George Brock. George Brock. I'll, I'll run around. I'll run. <laughs> you got called out by name. Uh, that may not be a good thing. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Adam, about just a few moments ago, you talked about the risks of polarization. Yes. I'd like to put a suggestion to you and see whether you agree. Sure. I think you're being very tentative and unambitious about this. You have, you described yourself as a one-stop shop. You're the largest one-stop shop for information on the planet. And I think you should stop worrying quite so much about problem solving for journalism. What actually you're doing is you have a potential role in a reconstru reconstruction effort in civil society. That does involve journalists, no question, but it involves a whole load of other people too. 
and you guys could go a lot further. I'd like to encourage you to go there. Are you going? We're okay. certainly going to try. I mean, I think what you're touching on, though, for me personally, is really resonates because we are, we're a large platform, we're a large company by any measure, but we're actually quite small in terms of the number of people we have given the implications we have and given our reach. And so we need to be honestly really ruthlessly focused on what's the most important, which is why I get worried when too much of our attention gets sucked into any one thing. It doesn't have to be supporting news and journalism. That could be um, a problematic type of content. That could be a new feature, etc. So I think that you're right. We need to do more, and we need to be a little bit more willing to put ourselves out there and take risks. Um, and that's going to mean dissent. That's going to mean we're not going to make everyone happy. And I think we've been a little bit too concerned about that in the past, but that's changing. Maybe too slowly, but it's changing. Like even Mark's letter for me is a signal, or rather is one step on a longer path to us being more proactive and transparent about what we believe, what we think is responsible for us to do, and what we think is irresponsible for us to do, and actually trying to affect change in the world. And I've been at Facebook for almost nine years. And that, has, that type of mentality has been growing over, I'd say, the last two or three. So late, we can do more, and I agree with the sentiment. But I think, we are, I think we're on that path. I, I think George just gave you license to do something big, which is, as he said, not just worry about us in the form that we are in now, but to boldly rethink how to inform the public. And that's something we can do in partnership. Thank you. Um, so I'm interested in algorithmic transparency. Yes. Um, I understand why a company like Facebook would not like to publish their source code. This is your intellectual property. This is your work. But I would like to know why um, you do not allow audits by independent scientists. For example, there was this one study conducted by, made by um, Facebook employees, data scientists by Facebook, which said that the filter bubble effect is quite low, quite small. But this study cannot be reproduced by other scientists because they do not have access to this data, this kind of data. So independent scientists cannot see and cannot test whether there are unintended consequences of your algorithm for our society. Why don't you open up your data? Why don't you allow such audits and papers being made? So I think algorithmic transparency is a really important issue. And there's different pieces to why, and one of it is providing context data access to data scientists. But to back up a second, and then I'll try to address your question more directly, I think it is in our interest to be as forthcoming as we can about how ranking works. I think the idea that there's some competitive risk with explaining how ranking works actually is really um, a myth. I think, honestly, we haven't figured out how to effectively communicate it. I talk about how ranking works every week to somebody outside of Facebook. And we're constantly experimenting with ways of doing so in, uh, more effectively. And in an, an ironic moment of empathy, I'm trying to figure out how to cut through the noise. We're trying to figure out how to explain something that's complicated and honestly really dry for a lot of people, like ranking, in a way that's going to be understandable and compelling so people actually listen. Now, you're talking about two different things, though releasing source code and releasing data. On source code, I don't actually think it would be that helpful. There are millions of lines of code that very few people in the world would actually be able to read. In fact, reading all of it seems completely, um, uh, what's the word? It just would be really difficult to do. And so I don't think that would actually be that helpful. Um, whereas um, data, I think, would be. Now, we have to be careful for a series of reasons, but we're actively looking at more ways we can push information out there um, not just so that independent scientists can do analyses, but also so that people can understand what's happening on our platform. Publishers can make more interesting or more informed decisions. Even lightweight things like how the consumption of different media types on Facebook has changed in India in the last six months, given the carrier price wars. 
That's real data that we can put out there, and I think there's no problem in doing so, and it's safe to do so, and that would be useful for publishers there. Um, in addition to doing more with scientists. So we're exploring it. We have to be careful for you know, a number of reasons, but I think we can, should, and will do more. Will that be far enough for you? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. We follow up on that in two ways. One, that is there a willingness to share data under some circumstances with researchers to learn more about how the public conversation occurs? Yes. Okay. The that's other a, thing I'd say yes. that I forgot is also we do share a lot of data already with publishers through data insights tools, but also there are other APIs, which is why there are data scientists and researchers out there who have done things. Are they sufficient? I'm not saying so. Um, but it's not, it's not actually a completely closed system. And a related question, we in media and then Google and then to an extent Facebook say, oh, we're a mirror to the world. Uh, and the mirror may be straight and true and well polished, but the world warps itself to try to manipulate each of us. And I think that these days we need to do a better job of exposing that manipulation. How are parties trying to manipulate you and thus us and the conversation? Um, is that something that, that we could collaborate on? So I'm not sure what you're thinking of when you say manipulation, but the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, spammers. So like false news is a good example. It's mostly spread by spammers. Our relationship with spammers is very adversarial. The more we expose about what we do and how we do it, and that includes data, the smarter they can be about working around our methodologies and our ideals, you know, our hopeful solutions. Um, and they do that on a regular basis. But I think you're probably talking about a different type of manipulation. Yeah, political manipulation, hate manipulation, the kinds of things that have affected elections around, um, uh, to name names, Breitbart, the alt-right in America, uh, what's going on now in, in, in France and Europe. I think that, that we need to understand it better. To yeah. th we, we don't understand it well enough yet to know what the solutions are to inform people about how they're being manipulated. That's all. I think that the interest in swaying opinion is old, is as old as time. And that exists not only in journalism, but also in other forms of media. And there are objective, moderate journalists, but there's also a long history of journalism with political affiliations. England's a good example. Most major newspapers have very clear political parties that they support and they're forthcoming about doing so. Now, that is, and that's a good thing. So I don't think trying to influence is a bad thing by, in and of itself. Now, there are other entities out there that I think distort and mislead, and I think that's where problems arise. Well, you're not being honest, or you're missing expectations, while you're, you're telling falsehoods. Uh, and that's where I think that we need to invest as a platform in trying to identify those patterns and then sort of address them. And then as journalists, if you say what, what can do in partnership, I think the more meaningful, high quality journalism that there is out there that's telling compelling stories that are true and important, the better. That'll help also counteract. Good morning. Uh, you say that Facebook helps people being informed and everything appears on my Facebook page is called news. But don't you think that there is a row, a border between um, my brother playing guitar and uh, mm, a war in Syria or attacking St. Petersburg? I mean, a difference in the information about the world and the information about my crew, my group, that for me, my modest uh, opinion is something quite similar, like gossip. And so don't you think that in the future, uh, a, res a responsibility for Facebook or for other groups should be to differentiate this kind of information that for me is not the same thing? Thank you. So of course, in, you know, your brother's picture of his band and an article from a news organization about Syria are different. And I think that people understand that. And I think that, they're, that though they're different, they both are of value to you. Connecting with your brother is honestly one of the you know, most meaningful things that we can help you do as a platform. It's family. Connecting you with information about what's happening in Syria is also meaningful and also important. So we want to be able to support both. Now, if you're asking how to differentiate them, I think there's a couple different things that we could do but I'd, I'll walk through some of them that we don't and some of them we might. 
I don't think we should separate news out of newsfeed into a separate surface. Because if we did, we know, because every time we've tried anything similar, news would get way less distribution on Facebook, which would then undermine the main goal, which is to support an informed community. Now, maybe we could differentiate more in terms of like, what is, what, is, what is a credible publisher and what is not. That's an idea that's come up recently a lot and we've been talking about. That could be useful, but that also might backfire. Trust in the media, unfortunately, is at an all-time low. And adding a badge to say that this publication is trustworthy probably won't help someone who distrusts the publication to actually trust it. So then the question is, what else can we do? And so that's why I'm particularly really excited about the idea of providing more context. This publication is based in the city. It's been around for this many years. It has these standards and values, which you can read here. And so that type of differentiation I'm excited about. The other one that I think we can do more on, which we hear a lot back from um, publishers, is um, supporting brands, letting brands flow through. Because it's important, I think it's good for us as a platform if Publications have strong brands so that when they are credible, they can accrue that value, and when they do things that are problematic, they can accrue that accountability. So those are the types of differentiation that I'd be really much in support of. But again, for each one, I want to be very clear about the goal and then be able to measure, is it actually effectively moving towards that goal or not? I'm over here to your left now. Uh, hi, I'm very excited uh, to be here because uh, in, from my point of view, you are one of the most powerful uh, person in the world because uh, uh, you and your algorithm every day decide what uh, one billion and uh, 700 million of person can see, what people know in the world. Uh, my question is, uh, in the future, uh, will Facebook share this power with uh, citizens, uh, elected parliament, uh, NGO, or will decide to keep this power for its purpose, its economic, uh, informational, and uh, maybe, I don't know, political purpose? This is my question. So we very specifically want to give publishers, politicians, and other entities the ability to actually more effectively reach their audiences on our platform. Because that's actually, over the long run, also, honestly, in our interest as a platform. So we're invested not only heavily in products for journalists, but also products for politicians. Um, Town Hall was announced recently, it's in the US right now, we're looking to internationalize, that allows people to connect with local representatives and allows representatives to hear from their constituents, which we think is good for accountability for politicians. So we'd like to share, I mean, your framing is power. We'd like to share influence through building tools that allow, whether you're a publisher or a politician or anybody else, um, a voice and information, right? It's always about a give and a receive. Um, and we'd like to do so as much as possible, one, because I think it's the right thing to do, but two, because it's good for us as a platform over the long run. I'm not sure if that is the kind of value exchange you're alluding to, though. Over here, then there. Hi. So, um, I guess one of the things that a news outlet can do to go beyond the article and provide services uh, uh, to their users, as uh, Professor Jarvis always says, is to create a chatbot. And um, still, it's very difficult uh, discovering and, and sharing chatbots on Facebook Messenger. Are you trying or developing anything to make chatbots easier to share and discover uh, in the newsfeed? Thank you. So, it's not my area of expertise, so I'll qualify with that. Um, I don't know of anything that we're doing in newsfeed, but I do know that the Messenger team is very focused on discovery because if you can't find a chatbot to communicate with in the first place, then it's going to be of no value to anyone. Uh, but I believe we are mostly focused on doing so within Messenger right now. The idea of doing it in Newsfeed is interesting. It honestly hadn't occurred to me. It would be something we'd consider, but we'd have to figure out how to do it in a way that felt like a good experience, both from the business side and from the consumer side. I think we have one over here. Hi. Um, I am looking at my Facebook feed right now, and also my friends are looking at it. 
and they realize that most of the things that we see is just news from news organizations, various news organizations, but I don't see any of, of my friends really posting that much content. And I think also video, I see, see a lot of videos. Is that your intention in a way to push news organizations more compared to personal content? Because I don't feel that's what Facebook really is or was for me. So that's not our intention, but everybody has their own experience. And honestly, what Facebook and Newsfeed are used for varies really wildly from market to market and country to country. In general, though, we have values and we want to encourage people to connect with friends, to post personal content, to connect with publishers, to consume news. But we also want to respect people's right to create their own experience. So if you want to only follow pages and have no content from friends, that's fine. And if you want to only follow friends and have no content from publishers, that's all fine. Um, what you're experiencing is a result of the people that you're friends with, whether or not they're sharing, and the publishers that you're following, and how compelling you're finding their content as well. Um, but we don't have a concept of should the average feed look like this composition, because we know everyone's interests are totally different. Some people are way into news, some people don't see any news, yeah. because they choose not to, yes? Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, links are a minority of the content on Facebook, but it's significant. And so most content isn't links, and most links aren't news. Now, I know some news can also be video. Video, you mentioned, is also growing very, very quickly. Um, but feed at the global average is mostly personal content. So I think we're about out of time, but I, 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 I want to ask one more question, which is, and you, and you said in your talk that you're quite nascent in your thinking about local. Yes. But what is that thinking? What, what does local mean to you? Because local to me isn't just geography, it's also your community. It's part of what Mark Zuckerberg talked about. Absolutely. Uh, how, what's local to you in your life? Uh, how are you, what do you want to explore there? Because this is, I think, a vital interest to many folks in this room. So I don't want to pretend like we have the answers for local news. I will say that a few things. One, we know local news is critically important to local communities and has been for centuries. But it's particularly difficult in a world where most publishers are either finding success in going very, very, very broad and being advertising-based businesses or um, more focused on a more avid reader base and going based on subscriptions. And local news kind of doesn't clearly fit into either category, and I think that's fundamentally where the challenges come from. What we'll do, I don't know. What I'm excited about is helping people find sources of local news in the first place. Simply just allowing them to know that these things exist and giving them more opportunities to connect to them, I think could be effective. And then the other is leveraging the fact that we are a social network and these are essentially communities. So whether that's through groups or messaging, I don't know, but the idea, there's probably some opportunities in activating communities around, activating local communities around local news, but I really don't want to pretend like we have the answers. This is one of the projects where we've intentionally decided to start at step one by working with publishers, and we've only been working on it for a few months. Well, I, uh, Chris and Ariana didn't ask me to say this, but I suspect I will speak for them when I say that uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the platforms, to Facebook and Google both, to be supporting this amazing uh, festival. And, and so thank you for being here, and thank you for doing that, and thank you all. I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure.